Welcome, Fusion fans, to the 2019 August call of the Nuclear Fusion Shark Tank. Tonight we have two wonderful companies, Compaq Fusion Systems and MIFTI. Compaq was founded in 2017 in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and is pursuing a cross between a liquid metal compression and a rotating field reverse configuration. MIFTI was founded in 2008, a spin out from UC Irvine in Los Angeles, and has won over $4 million to pursue a staged, stabilized Z pinch approach. Hope you enjoy both presentations. Take care. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk this evening. And uh, I, I think you're doing uh, the community of uh, fusion entrepreneurs a great service, both um, in the prior activity of the fusion podcasts. And, you know, when, when you did the interview with me a couple of months ago, we had great reactions to that. And I, and I appreciate the opportunity this evening of pulling information together. This is so this is the second telling of our story. And, you know, as stories go, they get better and better. Uh, with a telling. Um, so uh, what we did for tonight's uh, opportunity was to pull together a video and I'm going to share that right now and uh, for your, for your viewing, viewing pleasure, just give me one moment. Okay. Now, can you all can you all see the screen? That I'm. It's it's, it's a bit like, dark. <laughs> there you are. Shrinking, shrinking. Hi, I'm Simon Woodruff. I am the CEO and a co-founder of Compact Fusion Systems. The other two co-founders are Peter Turchi and Ronald Miller, and together. We're looking to develop a compact modular fusion power core for the utility market to put electrons on the grid. We founded Compact Fusion Systems in 2017 here in Santa Fe with the explicit intention of taking the stabilized liner compressor, a concept that was supported by ARPA-E at the time, uh, through to commercialization. We've since found support from the New Mexico Economic Development Department uh, and that has allowed us to engage with scientists at Los Alamos and at Sandia uh, to help us uh, design our new system. And we've found a seed round and uh, that's all helped us to uh, move things along. Uh, in the next 10 minutes, I want to talk to you about uh, the motivation behind our concept, uh, the, the concept itself and how it works. And then I'd like to speak a little to the, uh, the development plan that we have ahead of us for the next, uh, next two to three years. The primary motivation for pursuing our concept is defined in terms of the economics. We're doing two things. First of all, we are designing to cost. Second of all, we have picked a compact system that has low capital cost requirements. When we design to cost, what we're doing is we're picking a target levelized cost of electricity that is cost competitive and using that as a constraint to define all of the target parameters that we need to achieve in our devices as we build them out and test them. When we're building more compact systems, what that means is that the, the total cost of the system will be much lower. The, the total capital cost requirement, both in terms of the development costs and the deployment costs will be much lower for our system. Thanks to the RPE initiative on controlled fusion, I came out of retirement about five years ago to revive the Linus program and its concept for a controlled fusion reactor based on stabilized liquid metal liner implosion on top of a plasma. The NRL program started about uh, almost 50 years ago and was based upon the Soviet program of about that same time, which actually derived from Andrei Sakharov even earlier as a notion for creating a hydrogen bomb. The Soviet program involved implosion of thin aluminum shells or liners uh, onto a trapped plasma. Uh, the NRL program started that way and we were successful in uh, obtaining very high magnetic fields, mega gauss magnetic fields that way. 
unfortunately, the calculations indicated that we would need energy equivalents of tens of pounds of high explosive if we were going to approach uh, fusion conditions. And this was not a way to run a fusion program since that would decimate the laboratory each shot. Uh, we went instead to liquid metal liners, uh, which needed to be spun so that the inside surface would be stable against uh, so-called Rayleigh Taylor instability that would break up into droplets and poison the plasma. Uh, we did these experiments with liquid sodium potassium alloy, probably the hardest experiments I've ever had to do, and were successful at it. The outer surface, however, was not stable and needed to have a different technique for driving it. But what I came up with was using annular free pistons driven by high pressure gas in continual contact with the liquid metal liner to be able to perform the implosion. And we built the system, a prototype we call the water model, that worked quite well uh, in terms of developing the basic mechanics and showing repetitive implosion and re-expansion stably uh, using this technique. We then went on to other systems, including ones that use sodium potassium alloy, again, an adventurous uh, opportunity, and developed that as well, and a larger machine called Linus Zero that was tested with water. By that time, however, it was clear that we didn't have a plasma as a target for our implosion. So the money went away uh, to work on plasmas for the last 40 years, and the technology for using stabilized liquid metal implosions languished until the RPE initiative. So now we're starting off again. Uh, there are a lot of intricate details and challenging mechanical and electrical and pneumatic engineering problems associated with this technique. Uh, the basic concept has probably uh, been disclosed by patent 40 years ago. So it's all of the details of how to make it work correctly in the laboratory now that represent the IP that we'll be able to capitalize on. So how does this system work? Well, we like to use the analogy of a diesel engine where we have a cyclic compression of fuel to ignition. Uh, our system, of course, is a little bit different um, in that the piston itself is uh, a rotating hollow cylinder of liquid metal uh, that co collapses radially. Uh, and when it collapses radially, it forces the fuel to compress. Uh, we're not using a hydrocarbon fuel, uh, we're using deuterium and tritium in a, in a plasma state which we inject into that hollow cylinder uh, prior to the compression. Uh, lastly, uh, the energy recovery system is really quite different. When we burn the deuterium and tritium fuel, there's no drive stroke per se, uh, as in a burning a hydrocarbon fuel. Uh, instead, there's a neutron that's released and that's captured in that rotating liquid metal piston uh, and heats that that liquid up and that, that's then pumped uh, towards a heat exchanger and then we, we boil water, make steam and drive a steam turbine. So I'll take you through the compression sequence as we envisage it for our proof of principle device, the device we'd like to build out uh, in the next uh, three years. Uh, what you'll see is the plasma being injected from either end into a central region where the plasma collides, it merges, and then is compressed by the rotating liquid metal uh, piston. Uh, the piston bounces and then expands back outwards and uh, the process then repeats. So where are we at and where do we need to get to? Well, currently we're in the concept design phase for the compression system and the pre-engineering design stage for the plasma injection systems. And we've recently been awarded a small grant by RPE to complete the engineering design of the plasma injection system and also to relocate equipment from Air Force Research Labs. It's about a million dollars worth of caps and switches and charging supplies uh, in order that we will be able to build out our, our engineering design. However, 
to complete the, the design of the compressor and to complete the build out of the fuel injection system, we will need further investment. So we are looking for support from ARPA-E uh, to complete the engineering design of our double-ended plasma injection system and also to complete the design of our compressor. Um, we will be proposing a three-year program uh, where we perform bench tests of the compressor and plasma system separately and then integrate them into a combined test in year three as our proof of principle. This is, this is the device that we will build in order to demonstrate that we understand the confinement scaling in, in, the, in the plasma and understand how to build the next system that will be energy producing. So what will the proof of principle look like? Well, we have a, a conception. Uh, here it is. Uh, it will be about three meters long. You can see all of the capacitor banks that are used to energize the theta pinch coils. Those are the, the coils that form the plasmas in the first place and inject the plasma into the uh, compression chamber. Uh, you can see into the compression chamber there uh, and there's a pink glow currently, but that's where the plasma will collide and be compressed radially by the uh, liquid metal uh, compression system that we are currently designing. So the entire system will probably fit into our laboratory here in, in New Mexico. Uh, we may have to do some of the testing uh, at an off-site location, uh, but uh, th this is to give an idea of the scale. So the total cost for this activity will be about $9 million. We're splitting the program into two parts. First is the separate uh, bench test of the compressor and the injector, and that we estimate to be about a $5 million activity. The integrated test will come subsequently. There's some machine upgrades that we'd need to do in order to perform the integrated test, and we estimate that to be about a $4 million activity. We'll be applying to RPE at uh, when the next uh, solicitation opens for this sort of activity. But we're also looking for equity investments that would allow us to uh, reach our goals sooner and with greater focus. So thank you very much for watching our short video. It's been a lot of fun putting it together. If you'd like any further information, my email address is here. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you very much. Uh, very, very good video. Uh, we have questions. Questions for Dr. Woodruff. So uh, I've forgotten what the current grant was, the initial starting grant for MARPA E. What was you told me once what the size of the grant was? Yeah, the, so the initial grant uh, I think it was about four million, if I'm, mm -hmm. if, I'm if I'm correct. Uh, mm -hmm. I think they, they ended up with about three three million. Uh, to uh, design a rotating system, um, so so that's yes, yeah, so that's certainly the prior prior work. Okay, um, we are it, we are not likely to find a, mm -hmm. a nine million dollar um, grant from RPE. Uh, mm -hmm. It's likely it will be a lot lower than that. Um, and what's happening with RPE right now is that that. Scott Sue's bringing some some good good uh, clear thinking to the program, and and he's organising the fusion program into basically two camps. Uh, the, the proponents of fusion concepts um, are being organised into one camp, and then there are what he's calling resource teams uh, that are being organised for diagnostics or simulations or for costing or for uh, many other different ideas that are, that are possible right now so oh. it may be that we get supported if we're successful we may get supported by rpe um at the five million dollar level and then benefit from teaming with other resource groups that may bring us back up to that that nine million level mm -hmm. um sort of effort mm -hmm. so so what is the liquid liner made out of or do you turn it into liquid by putting energy through it <laughs> Uh, well, in the in the reactor scenario, it's it's uh, lead lead lithium. In mm -hmm. the in the test scenario, we have a, a water model that we're thinking about first, uh -huh. mm -hmm. and then um, a sodium potassium model that uh -huh. we're, we're thinking about second. Okay. Um, 
And and that's that's the piece of the puzzle that we'll probably have to do off site. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> I have a question. Um, so we, we know your core team. Uh, how, how many folks do you think you could get um, for supportive roles? I know that there's more than just the three of you. Yeah. So the way that we're doing it at the moment is that um, we're. I have a. I have two other companies. Um, and uh, Matt mentioned I have a Woodruff Scientific, and there are about eight of us now in, in Woodruff Scientific mm -hmm. um, engineers and technicians and scientists. So uh, we are currently subcontracting from Compact Fusion Systems to Woodruff Scientific for some of the technical work. So the concept design for the, uh, for the compressor is being carried out under under Woodruff Scientific. Um, so it, it may be that we move forwards with, with some of the Woodruff Scientific uh, staff, um, but most likely we'll, we'll be hiring in um, mm -hmm. as we move forwards, because we need, we need dedicated folk and uh, deep domain experts to move forwards with the FRC physics. We certainly have some of that expertise in the house at Woodruff um, in the form of uh, uh, Paul Seek, who, did his postdoc on FRXL and, uh, and other devices. Um, so, but yeah, so right now it's, it's a teaming arrangement in amongst my sort of burgeoning empire of um, startups. And, uh, and otherwise um, we are collaborating with uh, um, folk at Los Alamos and also Sandia. Um, and we will be working with UMBC, for example, and, uh, and folk at uh, Air Force. Mm -hmm. um, as we get this equipment transferred and uh, get it installed in our in our laboratory. Okay. <laughs> Are there other questions for Dr. Woodruff? If you, if you think of anything, um, mm -hmm. always free to email me at simon at, at oh, compactfusionsystems.com. Okay, good. <laughs> good. All right, Thank okay. you. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate uh, it. No problem. Um, uh, Anne Harriet, uh, you didn't get a chance to introduce yourself. Could you please uh, introduce yourself now? Sure. Um, hey, this is Anurag. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Hey, so I have a bachelor's uh, in mechanical with a specialization in cryogenics and, and vacuum systems. And right now I just wrapped up my, nuclear, my master's in nuclear engineering with a specialization in plasma diagnostics. Uh, he uh, he did his uh, his work under Zinkel at the University of Tennessee. Uh, he works uh, on diagnostics for East, and he is currently looking for a job in uh, fusion. If anybody knows of any positions, uh, please direct messages to me or him. I can refer. Anybody else want an introduction? I haven't seen anything else. Mm. Oh, would you mind just, I didn't get a chance to write, just quickly go over your background again, a couple of minutes, or? Um, you talk about me? Yes. yes. Oh yeah, um, I have a, I, my background is in cryogenics and vacuum systems, mm -hmm. and in my master's, it's uh, plasma diagnostics, so. Okay. We, can, we can send along a, a, a resume. Uh, he yes, did I can. Diagnostics on the East Tokamak with uh, PPPL and then uh, cryogenics uh, before in India and then a master's in nuclear engineering from the University of Tennessee. Okay. Well, if you're seriously looking for a job, then maybe you could, Simon or something could direct or, or Matthew direct the resume to me because I don't know what Trialpha is looking for, but they're expanding somewhat, so. Okay. All right. Sure. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, with that, I, I don't see anybody else who wants to name you. So let's start presentation number two. So uh, Mifty is a, a company that's been around since about 2000. It's a spin out from UC Irvine. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a similar group of people that founded TAE Technologies. So Dr. Raman was uh, working with uh, the folks that founded TAE. Uh, they won, um, they won, I think, over four and a half million dollars uh, through ARPA-E, through two grants, if I remember correctly, and they want to do a staged uh, Z-Pinch. Now, Z-Pinch is the oldest and first technology to ever get nuclear fusion. 
1958, uh, they, mm -hmm. 1957, late 1957, they uh, got fusion in a, in a pinch by dumping current down the side of a tube and that compressed the plasma. But the problem with pinches has always been the instability growth. Um, so pinches are well-established technology, but they have this pesky instability problem and there's various ideas to try to beat them. Nifty has one very good idea uh, that they have received funding for, and they've done a number of experiments. And uh, with that, I will let Dr. Raman go ahead and take it away. Okay, thank you, Matt. Uh, can you see my presentation? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, this work was started back in the 80s at UC Irvine uh, under the leadership of Professor Norman Rossiter. Mm -hmm. And he's the one who hired me in 1981. And when I came to UCI, I start working on this Z pinch, small Z pinch machine. And then later on, we worked together until the end of his life. <clears throat> I also worked, uh, he and me, we started working on trials for concept. So we wrote uh, probably 50 papers together in different journals. So when we were developing this concept, uh, he's also founder of Mifty, one of the founder of Mifty. And uh, uh, this Mifty was formed in 2009. Uh, and uh, so, uh, based on Z-Pinch, whereas uh, the alpha concept was slightly different, but I will just focus on this nifty concept. Uh, I would like to first of all recognize my collaborator, University of California, San Diego. We have a Farhat Beg and his team. Uh, they have been part of this experiment and University of Nevada, Reno, where we use uh, their machine and uh, we were awarded by RPE close to five million dollars and also strong atomic and US nuclear these are the private investors so they provided some funding and uh, let me go what is our company it was founded in 2008 basically by me Bostaker, and some other scientists from UC Irvine and businessmen we thought it's a good, good idea and uh, we have over 30 years of experience in fusion research and business people were quite successful in setting up many startup companies. Uh, so the real activity, uh, we were doing some experiment earlier, but uh, real activity started when we got the ARPA grant. And we also got two patents, one for energy and one for radionuclear production. And uh, as a proof of concept, uh, maybe we are the only company that achieved more than 10 per 10 neutrons, thermonuclear neutrons. And it is according to what the computer modeling predicts. And computer modeling also predicts that with 10 mega machine, this experiment was done on one mega, but 10 mega machine can give break even, and I'll explain as we go along. Now, uh, what different nifty does first of all we use very uh, sophisticated computer modeling and one of our code is mac2 code which was developed by air force uh, phillips lab and we got from them and we modified it and we learned over the last decade and this code simulates and uh, simulation and experimental data are very close and with this code, we were able to predict that 10 mega machine which we designed can give break even. Now, there is a recent technology it's called linear transformer driver, LTD technology, which can build a pulse power generator much more compact and, uh, uh, and, you, and also the cost is much lower. So for example, 10 mega machine we can build and operate and test. And we estimated budget is $55 million. And uh, if we calculate 
you know, these are kind of approximate calculation, but uh, based on that, a power production machine can be around $200 million that can bring the energy cost less than two cents per watt. And the timeline for this 10 mega machine is we, in the six to eight years. It could be early, but maximum could be six to eight years if the funds are available. Now, let me put what are the challenges of controlled thermonuclear fusion as you guys have noticed in our earlier talk and also uh, Matt just mentioned. Uh, so I put three, uh, actually four challenges. The first is you have to heat the plasma to high enough temperature so the fusion can start. And uh, for heating, people have tried RF heating, neutral beam injection, direct current, shock heating, adiabatic compression. So we rely on shock heating, preheating, and then adiabatic compression, and we can achieve temperature relevant to thermonuclear condition. Second is stability. This is one of the biggest challenge. Since 1950, people thought z pinch is a very good idea, but then they realized Rayleigh Taylor kills it. Mag now it is called magneto Rayleigh Taylor instability. And at the peak implosion, you develop instabilities like sausage or king, and there are other host of instabilities like Brishmeyer, uh, uh, Mishkov instability, which I'll show. So there are many mechanisms. First paper appeared by Marcy Rosenbluth to stabilize by adding axial magnetic field, but then you compromise on compression. You can also talk about mitigation and control. So basically, we focus on mitigation and control of relative instability, and I'll show you how. The third challenge is the confinement, that once you heat a stable plasma, then it should be confined enough for long enough time. Uh, for example, low-density plasma, which is like TOCMEC parameter regime 10 power 14 per cubic centimeter, you need confinement for seconds. But high-density plasma, like what we are talking about, which is larger than 10 power 23, in that range, you need a nanosecond if you get 10 kV. The final challenge is ignition. What ignition means that once the fusion reaction starts, whatever the charged particles you can trap in, neutrons will go away, but charged particles can deposit their energy to raise the temperature. And for example, DT, you get alpha particle. And if you can trap them, then you can achieve, you may achieve ignition. Now that requires large enough rho v, their rho is the density and v is the volume, like uh, ICF kind of plasma. But if you have a high enough magnetic field, then you can trap the alpha particle. And we rely on very high magnetic field, and I'll show you how, and that will trap the alpha particle. Now, what is the concept? Stage Z-pinch concept is fairly simple. It's a simple Z-pinch, but it's based upon two or three several stages. In the middle, there is a target fuel, which is based on deuterium or DT target, and which is like a blue cylinder, and then surrounded by a liner, uh, very similar to Linus, but this is based on gas liner. Right? You can use argon or krypton or xenon, solid liner like silver, copper, but high Z liner. So you pass the current through this cylinder and this produces magnetic field that compresses. Now it turns out that this configuration is very useful. What happens is that piston starts from the surface but it stagnates at the interface and this creates a secondary piston that compresses the target. And since it's supersonic and superarsenic, the shock wave propagate radially inward that preheat the target to several hundred EV and then adiabatic compression takes over. And this leads to stable high energy density plasma that is relevant to fusion condition. Now that's the concept. Let me show you a couple of images. In 1998 at UCI experiment, we took this image of, this is a shadow graph of a pinch and where krypton liner is imploding on a deuterium target. As you can see, krypton liner is unstable Rayleigh-Taylor outside, but 
when we observe this remarkably uniform uh, lines that uh, show that this is a target plasma. And that's when ideas start emerging. Now, a similar kind of image we got in 2017 when we did on Zebra Terawatt facility. And again, you can see this is again Krypton on deuterium. And you can see outside instability. This is closer to the peak employee. And instability grows to a very large amplitude, but the target remains uniform. And that encourages us that this idea should be looked more carefully. Now, let me give you overview. Concept is based on experiments and simulation. And employee of a liner plasma onto a target plasma must have a high Z radiative liner. So it stays cool and it can compress much better. It can control and mitigate the relative instability. Pre-shock heating and compression, formation of high energy density stable plasma, so it has a real prospect for high net gain fusion energy production, which has been described in some of our recent papers. Uh, most of these papers are co-authored with Norman Rostetter, so I just give credence to him. The first paper we wrote in 1995, PRL, uh, where we described this concept. And since then, the recent paper is number eight. It just appeared in Physics of Plasma of recent experiments. Now, let me go describe a little bit experiment we have done and simulation uh, using argon and krypton liner compressing deuterium target at Nevada Terawatt facility. Sorry. Now, here is the machine, Nevada Terawatt facility. This on the top corner, which is two terawatt one mega amp, current can rise in 100 nanosecond. And what we did, did is we built these electrodes, uh, gas injection system, we have a double nozzle. It can inject krypton and uh, krypton and deuterium simultaneously. And then there's a cathode which has a honeycomb and this, so that gas can flow through it. These are made from an alloy and remarkably they sustain many, many shots. Nothing happens. So that encourages us that we can make a high rep rate machine. Now, here are the images which we got. I just want to show you two set of images. These are taken uh, by XUV images, showing X-ray pinhole camera images. Now, on the top is when we have applied no axial magnetic field, just uh, z simple z things. And these are at four different times, like 80 nanosecond, 90, 100, and 110, one single shot. And it can show you uh, dynamics. And the second one is using Krypton liner. And see that interesting feature which I was showing in the shadow graph, which start appearing. This uh, results looks like a secondary piston I'm talking about. It's a high density uh, piston that compresses the target in the middle. And if we apply 1.5 kilogauss magnetic field, it produces a perfectly uniform pinch. Although instability is outside, but on the, uh, in the middle, it is very, very stable. Now, let me show you next in more detail. These are two shot, eight images of the single shot. All this is single shot, starting from 67 nanosecond, and it pinches around 100 nanosecond and you can see a very uniform pinch. Uh, compression is, it goes smaller radius at 106, but up to 116, it is still intact. So almost 10 to 15 nanosecond, the pinch remains. And then you start seeing kink instability, but you require only few nanoseconds. Here is with argon, it turned out that krypton is much more uniform and stable as compared to argon. Now, the first thing is we simulate, we did simulation MAC2 and we tried to compare simulation and experiment as closely as possible. This red line, this is a current profile measured and dotted line we uh, simulated from MAC2 matches perfectly. And then this is the X-ray pulse which we observe and dotted line is the simulated. So we 
show confidence that simulation can predict uh, very well. Now here are other images, which is streak images, if you are familiar with, it shows, it's a time integrated, it shows the outer boundary is imploding, is coming like a curve, and then it pinches and then it explodes back. Top is argon. This, uh, with some analysis, we can measure the radius and the velocity. When you use argon, implosion velocity achieves up to 400 kilometer per second, but with krypton, it goes even 600, 600 kilometer per second. And it is a much tighter pin. It's supposed to be, and that's why we emphasize that high Z liner is the best. And then we compare that with the Mach 2 simulation, and it is pretty close. Okay, next one, we, this is from pure simulation, and we try to describe the physics here. This is the compression ratio, uh, uh, sorry, iron temperature vertical and compression ratio horizontal for argon and krypton. And there are three phases. The first phase you can see is this shaded, is the shock dominated heating. And then this phase is basically iron thermal conduction competing with shock heating, going simultaneously. And then finally, adiabatic compression. Here's the temperature versus time. As you can see, the shock heating starts at 80 nanosecond, lasts up to 100 uh, nanosecond, and then adiabatic compression takes over. And you can see that for argon and krypton, from one megaam, we get almost six, seven keV, uh, actually up to eight keV for krypton and two, three keV for argon temperature. And that is where fusion can take place. And uh, Next one, we show how this heating happens. Again, this is argon and krypton, and this is the liner interfaces here. So this is at different time step, like 93 nanosecond, 98 nanosecond, 106. So you can see that the targets start getting hot and hot and hot. By 108, it already achieved 10 keV from simulation. And then it's adiabatic compression. Uh, but in krypton, the temperature heating, heating is much is much more, almost two, three times higher, and uh, it compresses much more. So here we give a kind of streak image produced in the simulation, and this black line, it shows the interface, and uh, this, this is the interface, and you can see, and the time is on this, around 100 nanosecond, you can see the target is here blue, and start getting heated in all these reflected shock waves. And up to here is, is the shock heating, and then adiabatic compression, and then you finally get a very hot plasma on the axis. This is in the case of krypton, is much hotter and much wider. So this is kind of describing the physics, and we have shown that how we control the instability by adding a very small amount of magnetic field. And this magnetic field, uh, which we put in, you can see the instability grows outside, but the target this remains pretty uniform, and the field is compressed in the liner region. You know, so uh, both axial and azimuthal flux, and at the peak compression, you can see in the case of krypton, field goes very high value. That this high field will confine the alpha particle uh, for higher current machines, and the target plasma is not well magnetized, so it's a high beta plasma. So this field provides insulation, stability, and ultimately alpha particle heating. Now here I show three possible, uh, four possible, like if you have no magnetic field, it is stable, uh, unstable. But if once you put 0.1 Tesla, it is pretty uniform, but 0.2 Tesla will make target very, very stable. And three Tesla is even outside is stable, but this you sacrifice the compression. So best thing is somewhere here. You know. So axial magnetic field improves the pin stability, inhibits uh, inhibits the conduction between target and liner, and it's the compression of field is like a snowplow, not like uniform compression. Now, this is real data. We took hundreds of charts. And these are the neutron measured from silver activation detector. There were two detectors. 
these detectors were well calibrated using Las uh, Vegas test facility where they have a plasma focus with well-defined neutron yield. So we went there, one of my colleague, Emil Ruskoff, he went there, spent two weeks to calibrate those detectors and it's, uh, it's the, the most conservative. So you can see these uh, counts versus time. And from these, these are average of, on three shots, each one. And you can see that average without zero magnetic field is like 1.7 times 10 per 10 yield. And if you add the magnetic field like 500, 1000, 2000, 3000 Gauss, then the yield is around one time 10 per 10. And, but it is pretty reproducible. And this neutron measurement is very consistent with Mach 2 simulation. And that is very encouraging. Now, here we put a bunch of shots in the last campaign, which was the, one of the most successful campaign. So this group of with 500 Gauss, this group is with one, uh, one kilo Gauss, this is with two kilo Gauss, and these shots with three kilo Gauss, and these red one was for zero kilo Gauss, no magnetic field. So as you can see here, you see uh, not in the same line, but this is pretty reproducible in all this. So the highest yield we got is around 2.5 times 10 per 10, but with zero axial field and using Krypton line. So then we say, okay, are these neutrons of thermonuclear origin? So we had four NTOF detector, time of flight, and two of them, one was placed on top of the pinch axially, vertical, and one is horizontal. Detector one and two were exactly at the same distance. And and then we try to look at the signal. This is kind of end off signal. We normally observe where you get this hard X-rays. And the second signal is the neutron, 2.4 MeV. And this signal, uh, then, then you get a scattered neutron from wall and water, whatever. From this signal, we, we took uh, vertical and horizontal and, and calculated the total charge uh, collected by each detector and we plotted vertical versus horizontal charge and they have a linear correlation for magnetic field larger than 0.5 kilogauss, 500 gauss. Red points are slightly off this line and that shows that these neutrons emitted from pinch were pretty isotropic and this suggests that they are all thermonuclear and uh, since we didn't see any damage in the electrode, so that means there is no beam target fusion, which is one of the uh, biggest uh, concern in all the pinch experiment that you get neutrons, like in plasma focus, it's due to beam target, not thermonuclear. But we spend enormous amount of time studying this isotropy, and this shows that they are of thermonuclear origin. Now, what is the next step, MIFTI? Okay, this is one mega amp. So next step is a, a nine mega amp pulse power generator based on new LTD technology, which we believe that it can give us break even, our simulation. Now that looks like this. So this is the LTD machine we currently operating at UCSD and uh, with our collaboration. And we got this machine from Sandia. It can give one mega amp very similar current like uh, we used at uh, Nevada Terawatt facility. But the good thing about this technology, simulation tells us that you have a very high efficiency of energy uh, conversion to the load, delivery to the load. Load is somewhere here. And these are all bunch of capacitors in brick form. Each brick is two capacitor with one switch. And if, uh, so we are testing right now this idea on this machine and uh, we already have a very successful pinch and we haven't yet gone to fusion experiment, but after testing based on this machine, we develop a nine mega LTD machine, which looks like this. Here is a small normal size human being. And this each circle is one cavity. So if we put 25 cavity, five on each, and this is the transmission line, so then we can get almost 10 mega machine uh, delivering. By the way, there is no 10 mega machine. Uh, well, there is one Saturn, but that is based on old technology. But this machine, you can 
imagine it's 10, 20 diameters. It can fit in a normal size lab. And with 10 mega machine, I will show you that it is, it is uh, easily can demonstrate break even. Now, these are some of the track two code we use for modeling. Okay, maximum current nine mega amp, and it delivers almost 250 kilojoule, uh, 8.6 mega amp. Delivers 250 kilojoule, which is 31% efficiency, and employee in velocity almost you can achieve 44 centimeter, for, if it for above 400 kilometer per second. And uh, so these are circuit parameter we already designed, and all we need to build this machine. And we did uh, some scaling that, okay, this is two mega m, one mega m, two mega m, three mega m, and 10 mega m. And the follow I to the power four curve in, the, in terms of neutron yield for DD. This is DD neutron yield. But for DT, this is Mach 2 simulation again. And what I plotted here is energy delivered to the load, which is around 286. Total energy stored is 800 kilojoule. 286 will go to the load, rest will just circulate. And total fusion energy output is above one megajoule. And this I call is break even. Normally break even, scientific break even is defined as thermal energy equal to fusion energy, engineering break even. That means you get energy more than whatever you stored. So I think this machine can get slightly more than whatever the stored energy. So this is a promising technology for fusion power production. Now, so far, what we did is stage G pinch is based on flux compression experiment. And this is a liner on target, produce stable pinch. Higher Z liner provides better results. How much time? Okay. Higher Z liner provides better results. This we have established over and over again that we use argon, krypton. We also use earlier neon. So krypton provides the best result. Uh, we wish we should have tried xenon that we might do at UCST. And small amount of axial magnetic field improves the pinch uniformity. Now we can achieve it in the gas puff Z pinches, we can achieve implosion velocity up to 500 kilometer per second which is very good. And iron temperature, we can get 20 to 50 keV. Above 10 keV, you get the highest nuclear cross-section. Now, DT neutron yield is isotropic. We have established beyond shadow of doubt. And the whole compression is magneto-inertial. What it means is magnetic field compresses the liner and that compresses the target, but this field diffuses in and build a secondary piston and build a very strong magnetic field at the interface. This can trap alpha particle. I'll show you in the next few slides. And so far, we got 2.5 times 10 per 10 as measured at Zebra. But this was one mega amp, normally operating around 900 kilo amp. I wish I could have gone to higher voltage, but they didn't allow us. So uh, net fusion gain, is predicted for a machine larger than nine mega machine. Possible other application. If this kind of machine, even if it doesn't produce power, it can be used for other like nuclear medicine, which is a severe shortage in US. We have to import from Canada and Holland and other countries. And there are uh, 50,000 procedures are done daily on using Tech 99. And this point source of neutron is excellent to produce that instead of building a nuclear reactor. And also you can do quality enhancement for precious gems, those other kind of thing. And there are some other things maybe possible for space propulsion, but I'm not going to talk about that. Now, production of radionuclide. Let me talk a little bit about that. Radionuclide require high flux neutron source. So that's why they use research reactor, not the power reactor because you cannot go nearby. Eight to 10 mega machine based on LTD technology can provide SCP. Uh, uh, so sufficient pulse repetition rate creating high neutron flux. Requires a very modest invention uh, investment, probably not more than $55 million. 
And imagine compared to a nuclear reactor, uh, there was only one reactor in Missouri and that is, uh, I don't know, it is in operation right now, but uh, that's the only source of, national source of nuclear medicine. Otherwise, only five places around the world produce uh, radionuclide. We envision developing neutron source for radionuclide in three to five years. This machine will not use any uranium because these are 2.4 MeV neutrons and there is a, a resonance uh, cross section for MO98 to convert to MO99, which decays in TEC99. So normally they use highly enriched uranium. We don't need to use that. So there's uh, no nuclear waste. And there's a severe shortage of nuclear medicine. The nuclear medicine cost will also reduce significantly uh, if we have a small machine operating in every city. Now, let me give you kind of envision to use for high gain. Now, we desire, the, the biggest machine, Z machine in the world is at Sandia. That can deliver 20 mega amp. Uh, circuit energy is around 2.5 megajoule. And they have done some experiments, similar maglift, but they use low Z liner like brilliant, and they use uh, laser preheating. Uh, our idea is like using high Z liner like silver liner with much smaller thickness, 70 micron, three millimeter tall, 15 millimeter, uh, sorry, 15 millimeter tall and three millimeter in dia, filled with high density DT or DD target. And this machine, we did simulation, very extensive simulation. And these simulations we have done with several probes. And I'm going to show you MAC2 results, this is for 20 mega amp. And this we use Lagrangian, Ilarian, Lagrangian, ALE, all kind of formalism, 1D, 2D. And these are all 2D results because all these codes are basically 2D. I wish to do it for 3D, but it, I don't think the result will change. And if I don't use alpha particle heating, then I get almost 3.5, around 3 megajoules, 3.5 to 3.2 by two different Ilarian or ALE. Pretty close. But if I confine the alpha particle and we calculated that alpha particle cannot escape because the magnetic field that interface could go hundreds of megawatts, so it cannot leave. So if you if you dump the alpha particle heating energy, then you can get almost 170 megajoule. So that is way beyond break even. So uh, for power production it will be somewhere between 10 to 20 mega amp. Uh, that's an engineering problem. But at least the idea can be easily tested on this machine. And uh, we realize we use silver, copper, and beryllium liner and gives a, we learned that silver gives the highest yield. Similarly, like we have seen in the experiment that krypton gives higher yield than argon. So uh, now, here I will show you a little movie of implosion dynamics. So there are four parameters, ion temperature, ion density, mass density, and neutron production rate. On the right side, you will see the energy, how it comes up and when. So let me play the movie, okay. It, it changes time uh, because toward the end, it, we try to get more precise, so it's like going, so it is same implosion. Now this instability you see is a uh, Wischmeyer Wisch instability, but that doesn't destroy the uh, target. Target is still pretty uniform. Temperature is rising. It's, uh, you can see it is going higher and higher. And as the implosion reaches towards axis, the temperature is now above 1 keV, 1.5, and now you can see neutron energy start coming up on the right side and density is also increasing. So one megajoule to my SI is going toward the end, it goes almost 170 megajoule. And then it explodes because of enormous fusion pressure, but during explosion, it becomes stable. Now, small radius, three millimeter, twice because of that, 
as you go smaller radius, relay Taylor instability kind of suppresses. Larger radius is more unstable than smaller radius. This paper was published by me and Norman Rosberg back in 19. So, uh, so that's the purpose of using small radius. Okay. Now, sorry. Let me stop this. Now, this is some of the images we have shown at two different times, like Krypton and Argon, uh, earlier time, later time, stable, and which is very similar. Oh, by the way, we also saw some secondary ne neutron, but very weak signal, uh, which is secondary neutron, 14 MeV. They come exactly at the time. But since it's so small, we don't think it's worth mentioning. Uh, okay. Uh, what is nifty is different. So, uh, well, our cost is low and uh, we can produce this in a much faster time scale. Market size is huge. As you can see in 2017, uh, world uh, electricity consumption reached 22,000 terawatt hour. And uh, which is, uh, so if we total fusion reactor replacement, uh, values of one trillion dollars if you want to replace all the nuclear reactor. So it's a low initial capital cost, but it is very attractive thing for the investor. You can get huge reward from energy production, but also quick reward for and uh, for radionuclide or nuclear medicine. So for investment point of view, this idea looks like very promising. And uh, we have ample evidence to show that. Thank you very much. If you have a question, I'll be glad to answer. Okay. Uh, does anybody have a question for Dr. Raman? If not, I have questions. No questions? Uh, um, okay, so uh, I caught the number of $55 million uh, for, oh. Turn it back on again. There we oh, go. Oh, hey, uh, Jim, are you up? Uh, yes. My mic was off there for a while. Okay, okay. Uh, do you have a question? I do. i just wondering, well, what is the current posture in the national lab like Sandia in supporting something like this? I mean, are you waiting for someone to come in from the outside or is, the national labs have enough money and support. So what's, what's the, the current posture? Uh, national lab doesn't have money. We got from ARPA around $5 million. We did experiment on a small machine, which is one megan. And uh, there are two ways to go. There is a four megan machine, double eagle at, uh, at uh, L3. We are talking with them so we can do experiment over there. And we are also trying to convince Sandia people give us some short, but you know, Sandia shorts are each short cost a lot of money. And uh, also they have also programmatic, uh, they have their own programs. So whether they can fit us in or test, uh, I don't know, but there is a possibility to do that. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I wish um, to do that, by the way, but... <laughs> I have many uh, children. <laughs> they are not even Norman wanted to do, but unfortunately, I'm still waiting. Did you know? Are the Russians doing anything with Z pinch and similar things? Because they've been Very big on good pulse power. You're absolutely right. This LTD technology, which I mentioned, it is developed in Russia. Mm. They actually came up with another beautiful technology. It's called compact switch design. C CSA, I did not put it in. Probably the machine we redesigned with that CSA technology, it's more compact, much more cheaper. Mm -hmm. And they are doing extensive work on that. Mm -hmm. And I'm afraid they will be doing this experiment much faster than we are going to do. Mm -hmm. Also China is doing, I was in ICOPS and I've seen many talks from China on LTD technology. Mm -hmm. And they have already 10 mega machines. There is no machine. 10 mega amp range, which we are proposing in the whole United States of America. Mm. If we build that machine, 
that machine by itself will provide a lot of interesting physics and a lot of other tests which you cannot do. Right now you have one mega amp or 20 mega amp. The 20 mega amp machine is very destructive, very expensive. One mega amp, we learned whatever we can. And uh, we are still learning students and postdoc at UCSD. But you cannot do high yield experiments. So 10 mega amp machine is the need of the hour. It must be there no matter what. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Otherwise, you will be left behind. Yeah, man. Yeah. Yes, Larry. Yeah. So, yeah, boy, I just have three comments. One is, first is fascinating work and, and great progress, and, and you're to be commended with with everything you're doing. As uh, a second is um, the uh, and the last slide on the presentation, you had market data, and you were comparing. You, you were using as competition, I think. I think the impression or the 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 um, implication was that you were using uh, the the existing fleet of 104 roughly reactors yes. uh, as as the competition with a replacement value of a, a trillion or whatever that was. Yes. Uh, and and I, my comment would be that that that's not the competition, and and you should think of the other form, the other ways that we deliver energy. And they're on a different cost curve. Uh, I, that, you know, I fully agree. What I was saying, yeah. is, you are absolutely right. Uh, yeah. Yes, that is one aspect because all those reactors are getting too old. Right. And they will not be replaced. I don't think so because people don't like that kind of reactor in their neighborhood. So yeah. you, you can see. Yeah, but so just to replace the, those, this is one of yeah, the it, if, if you look at that slide, what it communicates to someone who, who sees it is that there's a trillion dollar opportunity. I, I, I think that's, or whatever the number was on there, and, and I think that, that that's somewhat misleading if it's based upon the fission fleet. You, you have to think about the other, the other uh, competitors, the other technology competitors out there that are coming down in cost, and, and we're, we in the fusion community are competing against that. Uh, yes, you are right. This is given. These numbers were from my business colleagues. Yeah. And uh, right. to be honest with you, I cannot comment much on that. But there is a huge uh, opportunity here. As sure. I said, the first opportunity is that we can build a machine in the next few years that can at least start producing nuclear medicine. Yeah. Okay. Well, that was that was my that was my third comment was that. Uh, you know, on your website, you have these two other uh, business opportunities: the nuclear medicine, and um, uh, I've forgotten the other one uh, briefly here. But oh, uh, but, but I think I think uh, I, you know I think those are more more near term revenue generators um, that would be that would attract uh, capital. I think. Yes, we actually one of our investor U.S. Nuclear. We are investing for that purpose only. And uh, uh, they are pretty serious about that. Uh, right. we, we think that can start generating, because we studied that problem in a lot of detail. I'm not putting it here, much of the information. But uh, we have done, we got even a patent on that. Yeah. That what happened, yeah. 2.4 MeV neutrons are very interesting. Yeah. They can interact yeah. with MO98. For example, MO99 is the most commonly used drug. It goes into TEC99. And uh, you, you put six days uranium in the reactor, highly enriched uranium, about 20%. And then you separate MO99. Then you transport across the world. And then you deliver. And 50,000 procedures done single day in US. And 150,000 don't get it. It's a very serious problem. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And this can easily solve that problem. Yeah, I, I agree. It's revenues by itself. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, Larry, uh, I'm sorry. What was your last comment that you wanted to say? No, that that was it. That the alternative, uh, the alternative uh, uh, market opportunities, the, the nuclear medicine and the uh, isotope. Well, it was the other one was uh, transmutation of uh, you know fish and waste product. I think yes. I think there's some shorter term opportunities that that would be uh, that could attract the capital much more quickly. 
um, yes. de depending upon time to market and so forth. And, okay. uh, so, and you're in, you're in Tustin, is that right? Uh, yes, we are very close to UC Irvine and UCSB. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, right. And they're in Los Angeles. Right, uh, yeah, I, I know, yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. I, I so, remember uh, many uh, years ago, 10 to 15, that uh, Jerry Kolchinsky at the University of Washington was all over this opportunity in medical isotopes to be produced by uh, non, uh, by fusion, but not uh, net power producing fusion. And he thought that was a fantastic opportunity, but unfortunately I don't remember the numbers and I don't know if he's moved on from there or not. Hmm. Um, what, what, was his, what was his name? Uh, Jerry Kolchinsky. Uh, professor uh, at yeah. Yeah, Wisconsin. He moved to Wisconsin and um, they built a, a fuser lab there called Homer uh, with uh, John Sanitarius. And then uh, there were two companies that spun out of that effort, uh, Phoenix Nuclear mm -hmm. Labs and Shine Medical Technologies, mm -hmm. both of which are very strong um, medical isotopes uh, businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, so, oh, right. They're the guys mm -hmm. in Wisconsin, right? Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. They just yeah. added Paul Ryan to their uh, advisory board. <laughs> right. Uh, Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, it is it is ten ten. Um, so it's officially. I'm going to close the. Unless there are any more questions. Okay, uh, Matt. I forgot to tell you. Thank you very much for giving this opportunity. No problem. Uh, well, yeah. Right. Thank Thank you so much. Very, very valuable. Fun. Yes. Very. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Okay, I'm going to stop.